Today we'll be exchanging views on the polio-like illnesses that are affecting children. And there are a lot of parents who got turned away from hospitals and ERs and who doctors dismiss the symptoms. Um, and you know, the longer you go without treatment, the worse this disorder is going to be. Also, we'll be discussing the primetime premiere of The Connors without Roseanne and whether or not it is fair for public figures in Hollywood to have their reputations tarnished forever due to problematic comments. And finally, we'll be bringing you the latest CSUF and local news. All this and more on today's episode of The Report. And welcome to The Report, Cal State Fullerton's premier source for news, views, and info. I'm Ryan Mathy. I'm Sochi Lagunas. And I'm Leslie Duarte. Before we delve into our first hot topic, we'd like to invite you to be a part of this discussion on this semester season by filling out a secure Google form with your opinion on it, as many of these issues are changing and evolving, ranging from gun control, climate change, and abortion. All we ask is to please keep it civil. A polio-like condition that left more than 100 children in the U.S. at least partially paralyzed in 2014 is back. This time around, officials with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say that they have received reports of 127 patients under investigation for acute flaccid myelitis. The CDC reported 386 cases since 2014 and has mainly targeted children under 10 years old. The disease has already been seen in Florida, Ohio, and in California. There are four suspected cases. Scientists are studying whether the illness is linked to a respiratory virus that circulates in late summer and early fall. Despite extensive laboratory and other testing, the CDC has not been able to find out the cause for the majority of the cases or been able to treat the condition of halt its or halt its progression. The virus's symptoms are similar to those of the common cold and can include coughing, shortness of breath, and other asthma-like breathing problems. The afflicted typically de to develop the disease following a respiratory or stomach illness. In rare cases, it can paralyze a child's arms and legs. It can also cause muscle weakness, slurred speech, and difficulty moving eyes and swallowing. Although there is no definite diagnosis, doctors can identify AFM from a combination of symptoms and an MRI scan, which can reveal spine inflammation. So, if we have such advanced technological breakthroughs in medicine, why are these 20th um, century diseases still reappearing? Honestly, um, we're no medical ex experts, but um, I have to... If parents want to not vaccinate their children out of the fear that it can cause autism, I can understand that. But when you have the majority of the scientific community saying that it is important and people should vaccinate, vaccinate their children, I think we should listen to them. And like, I totally get it. Like Parents want what's best for their kids. So if this is something that people fear is going to cause such things as autism... I get why they wouldn't want to do it. However, at the same time, like you kind of said already, these are people and professionals who have gone through years of medical school and training and like lab experiments to prove that this is something that is going to benefit your children versus harm them. And so if we have all these medical professionals telling us to do something that is potentially going to save not only your child, it'll save your other family members, it's going to save other people you like, and it's going to be saving basically like future generations. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why we're not doing it. I don't understand yeah. why we're not listening yeah. to them. Um, and I, I don't know if this is correct or not, but like I also had in, in mind that maybe it has to do with climate change. I mean, we've been seeing a lot of differences with the weather. I don't know, maybe diseases are spreading through that or like even the mosquitoes. I definitely like to hear that side of it. Um, I haven't heard that before, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, they are saying, the report is saying that scientists and um you know, doctors don't know what exactly is causing it, but they are linking it to lack of vaccination. There have been a lot of outbreaks of certain diseases that were, you know, extinct, and now we're seeing them come back. I would love to sit down with somebody who doesn't vaccinate their children and hear their side of the story, see um, 
the facts that they have as to why they don't want to vaccinate their children. I think that's a valid argument to make, but at the same time, it is the responsibility of the parents to inform themselves on how not vaccinating your children could affect your child and the children around them. And speaking of people who do not want to vaccinate their children, um, people we have like Jenny McCarthy, who was a huge advocate for not doing anything with your children that involves some sort of immunization. And she is like a very big, like celebrity, she has a huge following. And don't get me wrong, like I think she's great. I think she's funny, I think she's beautiful. She can do no wrong, except for this. This is very wrong when she's talking about not vaccinating your children to her huge following. And so because of this, people are following somebody who has no medical training, no medical experience, and it's incorrect. It's not the right thing to do. Yeah. And so again, obviously to each their own, if you wanna do this to your children or not do it to your children, let's say, that's fine, but just realize that there are consequences to yeah. it not just to your children, yeah. but to others as well. Yeah, I th yeah, I agree. On Tuesday, October 16th, the new ABC show, The Connors, premiered as a spinoff to Roseanne, which had attempted to make a comeback this past spring, but was swiftly canceled after Roseanne Barr was fired for posting a racist tweet about the Obama White House official, Valerie Jarrett. The new spinoff features the full original cast of Roseanne, with the exception of Barr herself, who was written off the show as an apparent death by opiate overdose. Although initially Barr was an apologetic to the blaming her medication to the comments she made, the head of ABC took it very seriously. The show's content was removed from the network website the same day and the reboot of Roseanne was canceled after only two episodes. Dropping the old reruns from Roseanne from all cable networks and removing episodes from streaming networks, almost removing all traces of that show ever existed the day after one comment was made, sounds a bit extreme, but is it justified? Is it fair that Roseanne should lose her show and all traces of it immediately? Or should this one mistake, however problematic it may be, be the end of Roseanne's career and essentially, or does she deserve forgiveness at some point in the future? Yeah, how do you feel about that, Sochi? Obviously, I, I, I believe she deserves forgiveness, but it's really hard to, I, I mean, everyone has a right to freedom of speech, obviously, everyone does, but when you have such a big platform like that, and then especially in today's society where everyone's getting, you know, like, just, just in general, like, comments and stuff, like, it's, even like companies now before hiring, they're even checking like, oh, what are you posting? What are you liking? What are you tweeting? And if it's against what the company's, you know, regulations are, then you're pretty much screwed. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think um, she has, I think everybody deserves forgiveness um, if they apologize. And furthermore, they educate themselves on the people that they offended. I think they should be held accountable for the comments that they make and who they offend and um, you know, this is not good to have somebody on a uh, public figure in Hollywood say something and not be held accountable for that. There are people watching, and just in general, everybody in general should not be ra tweeting anything racist or offensive. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you need to educate yourself on why that was offensive and move forward to not do that again. And as much as it's not good, it's also not new. Like Roseanne has been on the air since like the late 80s, early 90s, and she's no stranger to like making these sorts of jokes that come at the expense of certain minorities or stigmatized groups. And so like we're aware, we've known this, we know that yeah. she does these sort of things and so, just with this whole reboot, she's now coming into a different decade of comedy where back then it was more like free to kind of do whatever you want because there weren't necessarily platforms for people who were being offended or being attacked to kind of voice their concerns. But now that there is with the social media and the internet, you can't make these jokes without there being some sort of consequences. And also considering like it's ABC, she's on a family network. So if you're making these jokes on a family network where supposedly children are watching, what is that teaching to future generations or their children watching this show, you know? And so, yeah, like you guys said, I, at some point, I feel like she might deserve forgiveness, um, but that's only if she can give us like a real heartfelt apology. Yeah. Um, and if not, like yeah. even like even if she doesn't apologize, she's still going to have a following. She's still yeah. going to have, you know, people who want to listen to what she has to say. But she just needs to be aware now that like if you're going to continue to make these sort of jokes at the expense of other people, you're going to have consequences to it. Like she has seen very obviously with her getting kicked off her own show. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I think it's a good time to where people are being held accountable for mm -hmm. what they say. Um, it's it's 2018. You can't, you know, you can't overlook these comments. You can't, you know, just say it's a joke. It's serious, offensive 
words that are being said that hurt somebody and she should be held accountable for them at the same time still given forgiveness as we all deserve. Yeah. On to more news. On Monday, October 16th, the first Santa Ana winds left thousands of Southern California residents without power. Over 43,000 Edison customers in 83 different areas in Los Angeles were left in the dark. Among these different areas in Los Angeles were Canoga Park, Valley Vista, and Mar Vista, but the most affected area being the San Gabriel Valley, in which more than 9,000 customers in the Altadena area were left without power. Schools in the San Gabriel Valley closed, and business owners said that they had lost money because of the power outage. Maurice Iskender, owner of Lindsay's Liquors in Altadena, said, quote, we lose money, we've got to pay the bill. Anyway, if there is power, if there is no power, you've got to pay. So it hurts the business. I hope it will come back soon, end quote. The Santa Ana winds are expected to return, but this time, California forecasters say that it won't be as strong. Now turning to campus news, midterms are underway. It's already the middle of the semester and parking on campus is still as terrible as ever. Anna Aragon has more on the story. A new semester can be very stressful for Cal State Fullerton students. Balancing classes, studying, having a social life, all while trying to get a good night's sleep can be a struggle. And on top of that, students also have to deal with something as simple as finding a place to park. Cal State Fullerton is a commuter school, which causes every parking lot to be completely full by 8.30 a.m. and it seems as if each year the situation worsens. The East Side, Nutwood, and State College parking structures are the first to fill up. Many students have even complained that they've had to skip class or been late because there is no space. A few times missed, but most often it's being late and like rushing and being out of breath to get to class, but yes. I leave at like 8 o'clock and there's hella traffic. I have class at 8 30. Back in 2016, the school introduced new plans to incorporate a shuttle service and alleviate the hassle of parking for some students. So I've used the shuttle service for I think two years now or maybe three and a half semesters and um, it's been really nice. Uh, I just, now I don't have as much stress because I know for sure that I'm going to be able to find parking as soon as I get to the, the church and I just pull in, um, park. Cal State Fullerton sells over 18,000 permits per semester and charges students $236 each time. You would think that with that kind of money, there would be a semi-guaranteed spot just for you. Many students have offered solutions they think would be good ideas to reduce the weight to find an open space. You know, um, you know, try to try to learn the patterns. There's, you know, people leave at certain times. Other than coming early, just know when classes get out. Like they usually get out like 10:45, 11:15. So that's when the students are coming out, and you can easily find parking. For the report, this is Anna Aragon. This semester of fall 2018, Cal State Fullerton introduced 22 more all-gender bathrooms after only having eight in previous years. Our reporter Melissa Galuzzo has more. On September 18th, Cal State Fullerton announced the opening of new inclusive all-gender restrooms on campus to accommodate its LGBTQ community. This is a step towards creating a safer environment as many LGBTQ students face prejudice and judgment for using a presumably wrong restroom. In the fall of 2016, Cal State Fullerton had only eight all-gender restrooms available on campus. Over the past few years, the numbers have increased and now the campus has a total of 30 all-gender restrooms available. Yes, I think with the increase from eight all-gender restrooms to 30 all-gender restrooms across campus, I think it shows the not only student community, but the whole campus community that our campus has a commitment to supporting all LGBTQ folks, especially our trans and gender nonconforming student population. The National Center for Transgender Equality conducted a study in 2015 reporting that 59% of transgender and gender nonconforming Americans avoided using a public restroom and 24% had their presence challenged. I mean, I guess if it makes people feel more comfortable, then it's good so that everyone has a place to go. Because I read in the email that like people don't use the bathroom at school because they don't feel comfortable. So, I mean, if it makes them feel comfortable, then why not? If people don't like it, they don't have to use it. The LGBTQ Resource Center website has provided students and staff with a list of the all-gender restrooms on campus. They also have an interactive Google map where you can see exactly where each restroom is located 
and how many there are. I think it's great just for in inclusivity because uh, especially at campus here, we strive so much to be like very diverse and you literally see every color, size, shape, I don't know, of people here, which I think is awesome. So I think it's really great that we're catering to everyone's interests. For more information about the LGBTQ community at Cal State Fullerton, visit fullerton.edu slash LGBTQ. For the report, this is Melissa Galuzzo. In other news, Disneyland's plans for a fourth hotel has come to an end. Originally, Disney proposed the hotel idea to take advantage of a City of Anaheim tax incentive for building four-star hotels within the city. But when Disney killed its Western Gateway project after local opposition to that plan for a new highway entryway to the resort, it moved the site for its fourth hotel slightly south to make way for a second parking garage on the former site of Pinocchio Surface Lot, south of the Mickey and Friends parking garage. The city of Anaheim decided that change in address reflected a substantial change in hotel project, especially since it meant the closure of several downtown Disney businesses, including the movie theaters and four restaurants. So the city pulled the tax incentive from the project, which led to Disney putting the hotel project on hold. But it is official that the projects for the four-star hotel has been completely canceled. The Arrow of Sandwich has opened earlier this month, but aside from that, no other plans has been made for the empty lot. It is up to Walt Disney's Imagineering and Disney's development team to decide what is up next. Halloween is around the corner and Halloween the movie is slaying the box office as the number one movie is taking a total of $76.2 million over the weekend. It is the 11th movie in the 40-year franchise being a sequel to the first Halloween. It's bringing back the original cast from the 1978 film, producer John Carpenter and Jamie Lee Curtis. Halloween is killing the competition and beating out Venom and A Star is Born in this weekend sales tickets. Speaking of guys, Halloween's here. What are you guys going to dress up as? Start. I haven't dressed up a bunch of times for Halloween, so I mean, I don't have that experience of like, oh, trick or treating. Oh. You know, I, I don't know. I, it was just my childhood, you know? Okay. Yeah, it's kind of so sad. Kind of sad. <laughs> kind of sad. <laughs> sad. But um, um, maybe a Hogwarts student? Hogwarts? I've always wanted to have that, you know, That'd be really cape cute. tie. Yeah. What Hogwarts yeah. house would you be? Uh, the one where Harry Potter's in. Oh, okay. Like Gryffindor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gryffindor, there you go. <laughs> yeah. A lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Leslie? Um, honestly, I haven't thought about it. I've been so busy with midterms, but I'll probably just put something together, something cute, put some, like, bunny ears on or something, and call it an outfit. And call it an outfit. Yes, yes, we'll yes. Not to upstage your cute bunny glitter outfit, but <laughs> um, I will be Guy Fieri. This is something wow. that has okay. been in the process for years um, after being... Consider to be Guy Fieri multiple times, I think just because of like the physical appearance, but I'm very excited for it. I, I'm i super excited. I'm super excited to see what you guys are gonna be wearing too, no, as yes. well, right? Yes, Awesome. Great. Well, that is all the time we have today on The Report. Stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Ryan Matthew. I'm Sochi Lagunas. And I'm Leslie Duarte. Stay fresh, Fullerton.